uh, very much for the introduction and thank you all for being here. Um, the way we're going to do it this evening is going to start off with some, uh, some ideas, so like five ideas. I'm going to ask each person to give us five ideas as to what is happening, what, what went wrong, what could be done, uh, what are the most important things we need to think about. Uh, and then we're going to dive straight into questions and really try and uh, get, have a proper debate and really try and think about what what's happened and how do we fix it. So um, while our fantastic panel are giving us their thoughts, I encourage you all to have a think about what are the key questions you think we should be discussing. Um, so Claire, I'd like to start with you and your, what do you think are the most important issues that we ought to be discussing tonight? Okay, so I've got five points which answer the debate question, which is why women experience um, sexism and se well, in fact, the, I think the question was sexual harassment and blatant bias in the tech industry. So, from my perspective, my, I think it's a question of numbers. Um, I've been working in IT only for eight years, and I have consistently been either the only woman in the room or mm. one of a very few women in the room. Um, and in any um, culture, any any um, group where there's a majority group, microaggressions thrive. Um, and in IT, this majority group is white, middle-aged and middle-class men, um, usually wearing grey suits with pale blue shirts, I've noticed, but that's not a... I don't know if that's actually a prescribed part of the uh, uniform. Uh, Grayson Perry calls these, um, this group the um, default man. Um, so to be accepted by this male peer group as a business leader, a business owner, I've experienced pressure to conform to and to accept uh, a tone of humour that is tinged with sexism. Um, and that's been consistent through my time in the industry. And it's hard to challenge that status quo from the minority position. So I think if we want to transform the industry and make it more inclusive and a less hostile place for women, then it's that... The, the tribe, the default man, which in fact needs to challenge the behaviours. Uh, when I've challenged, and I have challenged over and over again, this uh, humour which is tinged with sexism, I've found that uh, most men that I have spoken with are, are ignorant of the discomfort that is caused um, by this pervasive, low-level, everyday behaviour within the industry. And it occurred to me when I was thinking about this and what I was going to say today that unusually before I worked in IT I had a, a different career working in psychiatry and mental health and it occurred to me that in this industry most people who work in it haven't been educated on socio-political issues and I think that that ignorance and the, um, the lack of awareness and I think it's a genuine lack of awareness of the impact that um, behaviours have on, on women. I think that that's the, um, that's the greatest challenge. So to the starting point to transform the industry, I think, has to be in education. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, John? Um, well, it's nice to be the only man on the panel for a change. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, um, I think one way of looking at, starting from where I am, look, looking at the internet, is that it, is, it holds a mirror up to human nature. And what we see in that mirror uh, is, in my opinion, very scary. Um, and it reminds me of some of the research that people have done on Google searches. So, for example, um, people thought when uh, Ob Barack Obama was elected that, that racism in the United States was actually a disappearing phenomenon. Um, it turns out that uh, if you look at queries on, on Google, for example, and this has been done by several researchers, you find that they were able to draw... Um, very precise maps based on Google searches for the word nigger. Um, and what those maps showed is that they correlate very closely to, for example, the areas where uh, Donald Trump did unexpectedly well. Now, the point about that is that, um, and this is, this is why I think that what, what the net, what, what, if you imagine the internet as, as, a, as, as a mirror for human nature, what you see is something that we have in, in, as it were, in, in, in normal mainstream media tended to 
uh, obscure, but it is frightening, frightening levels of misogyny, of hatred of women, um, which is, which is mind-blowing, in, in my opinion, and I think it's a real phenomenon in our society. It has disappeared from public discourse because it's not politically correct and so on, just as racism has in the United States, but it's real and it's vivid and it's here. Um, so it's not surprising that, in a way, this, this problem exists in the industry. Um, now, the other thing is that um, one sees it in other ways, like, for example, um, the a number of celebrated cases. There was the one recent case of James Damore, um, a Google engineer who wrote a, me a memo that went viral within, within Google and for which he was uh, subsequently fired by, by Google for, uh, because he, he, his behaviour did not conform to the company's culture. Um, I, think, I think it was probably a mistake to fire him. I think it would have been much better if his arguments, so, such as they were, had been taken on head-on by the company and by its leaders, in the sense that um, his, his, his memo was full of holes, logical um, in terms of his knowledge of... of, of it, it was full of assertions that didn't hold up. They ought to have been challenged by the company, but instead that he was fired, and in the process then became another hero for the old right in the United States. So that's the wrong way to handle it. I think, I mean, maybe that he ought to have been fired eventually, but there ought to have been some way of, of handling that. Um, another case is, is the Susan Fowler case, where she, this is a software engineer who worked in, in, in Uber, which is one of the most pernicious corporations in the history of the world, um, which is blatantly sexist from top to bottom. Um, and she, she was um, abysmally treated within the organization. Um, in ways we don't need to go into at the moment, but it's pr pretty blatant. Uh, but unlike many victims of this, she then intelligently went public, and she published an amazing blog post detailing what had happened. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that it, it led to a, a real storm. The fact that she went public led to a storm. It led to the, to the change in the higher management of the company, and... More importantly, it led to an awful lot of people, especially in New York, simply cancelling, deleting the Uber app from their phones. Mm -hmm. And suddenly that really made a difference. And my feeling is that this is, this is one of those areas where uh, it's worth paying attention to. When you want to deal with this, this kind of level, this problem, you have to deal with it in ways that really hurt. And in this case, you have, they have to hurt the bottom line of the, of the corporation. Um, another interesting aspect of it is, is the the frightening degree that we have discovered of really blatant sexism at the core of the, um, of the tech business, which is in the venture capital sector. It's extraordinary what goes on, what has gone on, and we're now beginning to find out about in that area. Because, of course, at the venture capital stage, people in this industry are at their most vulnerable. You're looking for money. Okay, and then you find that actually, not, not just in terms of... of this kind of sexism that we've just talked about, but also in terms of actually the, the, the expectation that somehow um, some kind of sexual favours would, would perhaps, you know, help with funding. Um, it's extraordinary in, this, in, this, uh, in a business that's supposed to be based on rationality and, and objective assessment of, and so on. Um, and finally, a, th a thought that has occurred to me many times, which is, that among other things, apart altogether from the um, from the issues about human rights and and so on that that, that it shows up, is that actually it's very stupid for an industry that that has fifty percent of the population as its users for, for it to be so driven by males. Um, there's a lovely story by once once by um, Dave Barry, who's a very funny columnist on the Miami Herald, and when when the Humvee was first launched on the market. Some somebody in the publicity department of Humvee. Uh, those of you who have, have you ever seen a Humvee? It's the most grotesque jeep. It's like a a, a jeep on steroids. <coughs> um, anyway, the, the, in, in some and Arnold Schwarzenegger had two of them, so that's not okay. It's, it's a grotesque um, jeep. It's used by the U.S. U.S. military. Um, they gave this famous columnist a. Um, a Humvee to try out in the hope that he would write about it and he, he took it and then he 
he took his wife for a ride in it. And he was explaining to her all this kind of stuff. And she said, well, what, what can I do? What can I do, David? And he said, um, uh, oh, he said, well, you, you can inflate or deflate the tires on the move. And his wife said, uh, Dave, why would anybody want to do that? <laughs> and that's, that seems to me to be a very classic sort of um, way in which this industry, which is dominated by men, misses tricks all the time. Because it's, it's basically working on problems that men have. Not that human beings have, but that men have, and so on. So um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's both wasteful and iniquitous and, and horrible, and I hate it. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Amanda. Right, yeah. So um, I would like to take a little bit more of um, an introspective or reflective um, perspective on, on the topic. Also being a woman uh, who has been in the main since I can remember, actually. So studying computer science, being... A, amongst the 5% since I can remember. Um, and the three things that are dear to me uh, that I kind of try to focus on um, in a constructive manner so that I can actually advance in my career are uh, bias, uh, attitude, and expression. And I'm gonna say a little bit about uh, each one of them. So, so the first one, bias, uh, implicit bias, um, it's not as simple as it sounds. Uh, and it's not as simple because it's something that I think that we women, um, or any minority as a matter of fact, uh, has to do something about actively. Uh, and it's not about saying, hey, there's a bias, you guys should fix it. It's more about us realizing why is there this bias and what can I do to transform the way people see us. For example, um, it has happened to me many times, or, or this is maybe, I don't want to generalize, but. Um, I feel that my male colleagues um, are much, um, it's easier for them to demonstrate or to exude and emanate confidence than it is for women. And hence, the implicit bias that men can do bigger or more difficult jobs because the women have seem to be more timid or more humble about what they can actually really do. And as a consequence of that, uh, if I have something really difficult um, that I need somebody on my team to do or to solve, maybe I'll just without thinking much, I'll just hand it to the guy before I hand it to the girl. So here's an example of an implicit bias. Uh, and I think we women need to think about, hey, when I, when I do something, maybe I can be a little bit more, a little bit more show off here, or a little bit more confident about the results that I actually achieved, just to actively counteract this implicit bias. Um, so the second thing is attitude. Um, I think that um, I've, I've also worked in industry actually one year, uh, and um, I've seen many times that um, my male colleagues tend to be much more happy about taking bigger risks and much more at ease about being aggressive about their goals. Um, and I don't know if this has something to do with women being a little bit more, I care about all the consequences that anything I could ever do has. And um, it's about this 100% thing, that whatever I do has to be 100% correct. And I realized that maybe some of my male colleagues were like, yeah, if it fails, I don't care, kind of. And it's not, it's not that it's, the ramifications are really bad. Um, at the end of the day, it's more about, well, at the end of the day, they actually tackled it. And they actually managed to make it work because they had the courage to go out and do it. Uh, whereas. Myself, I tend to be so careful, and a lot of my female colleagues tend to be so careful about what we actually tackle, that we don't exhibit the courage or the confidence, and hence we don't get the bigger, the bigger jobs at some point. Um, so that's the second point. It's about the attitude. So uh, what I try to do constructively is, is maybe when I, when I hesitate about taking on a job, is, well, why don't I, why don't I actually tell myself, actually, no, I, I have all the skills to do this, and I can actually do this. And if, if worst comes to worst, it's not really that bad, even if I do it as an 80-20 job. Um, and the last thing is actually um, expression. Um, and I think that uh, we need to think about how, how we express ourselves in meetings um, and, uh, and make sure that we're heard. Because um, it's also because women maybe have higher voices uh, in general. But I think that um, it's been many times that I've been in meetings and I, my voice was just not heard, simply not heard. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think we have to um, not just let that slip, but actually go up to the person and say, hey, you know, this is what I want to say, and this is why, and X, Y, Z, and here's the result of if we would do it this way. And actually insist and not just let it slip by and, and let it go under the table. Because 
the people who don't hear us, they have to realize that they didn't hear us because otherwise no, nothing ever changes. So those are the three points that I kind of think about on a daily basis. Great. Thank you so much. And um, uh, Valerie? Right. Well, um, first and foremost, I'm a software engineer. And many things, but really, I, I describe myself as a software engineer. And I entered the computing software industry in the early 70s, and I've been there ever since. So my first point is, it's great. So there's a lot of negative press and negative bias about the computing industry, software industry, tech. But all I can say is it's a great industry to work in. Now, there's nothing... And I've been through various changes, um, particularly the birth of IT. And now we've got the birth of IoT and the emergence of tech as a separate industry. And I think that's important, which I'll refer back to later on. But I think one of the reasons why I find it so great is because there is opportunity, there's variety, and there's flexibility. So from there, what are the, what are the issues? Well, the, the first issue that I have, I set up a company on my own, and it's always recruiting, and recruiting people of any sort, any gender, any, any yeah, just anybody. <laughs> um, there is a problem recruiting. So when I've been out talking, I go and give work experience, I talk, and I've even been to Glastonbury performing um, about engineering and how brilliant it is and how, and particularly trying to get women involved in that. And I think the problem that I've seen is that it's such a narrow cohort of people that end up wanting to come into it. It goes back to Amanda's point, that you end up <coughs> with a very small section of the population who even think about it. So then from that section of the population to get the people who are then talented and from then the diversity, it all narrows itself down. So I think that's the first thing that we need to look at. Why is it that our industry only speaks to a narrow cohort of people? Um, because we need to engage with that better. So I mentioned um, opportunity, variety and flexibility. And, you know, it... it those can work and they can be offered, but they can only be offered if the environment that you're working in offers them. So the work itself lends itself to those things. But what I see is that the environment that are set up for the work do not necessarily offer them. Obviously, I've circumnavigated that because I set up on my own. And that was sort of a deliberate choice because I wanted opportunity, flexibility and variety. So I've, I've, I've managed to get that. And, um, and that's sort of motivated me. And in fact, if you read about women setting up in business, there's an awful lot of women who set up on their own in business, and that is often because they want opportunity, variety, and, and flexibility. So I think looking at the environment that we have in our industry is another way to address it and to think about how the, the things that make our industry really good and make computing and software really great to work in come out in the in the, in the workplace. Uh, the fourth point comes back to what others have said. Um, you know, you experience, um, you know, people wish I was a man. You know, I walk in the door <laughs> and they wish I was a man. Now, having the name Val, and, and I, I was talking to a friend Richard and saying that, that one of my icons was uh, Stevie Shirley. When I was young, she was setting up FI and... Um, you know, that, that sort of inspired me. And, and she called herself Steve and I call myself Val. So often people don't know that Val, you know, they, they assume I'm a man. And so sometimes I do go in and they are absolutely surprised that I'm not a Russian man, honestly, or a Valentin or an Italian man. You know, so people do want you to be a man, but you, you know, you're not a man. So they've just got to get used to it. You know, I've never let it bother me. And I never let, and there is humour and that's tinged with various things. But to be honest, I'm only interested in the software and the engineering. That is what inspires me. That's what I'm there for. So it sort of goes over my head. And I know that, I sh you know, you can't ignore it and there's some blatant things that happen. But I really just sort of get on with it and be, and, and be me. Um, but one of the reasons why I, again, set up on my own was because it became clear to me in my very first job that the ma my male colleague who'd started on exactly the same day as me was getting all the opportunities given to him first before me. And I went to my boss and I asked him the question straight off, why is that? Because I, as I say, those sorts of things sort of go over my head, I don't see them. And he said, well, because you're a woman, is basically it. And that was, 
it was so clear. I mean, in those days it was. You know, you could say those sort of, you wouldn't say it now, but you could say it then. And, um, you know, I sort of went and thought about it and said, oh, OK, then, all right, I'll just go off and do my own thing then. Because, and I always knew that I'd have to be better because I'd be scrutinised more if I wanted the opportunities. And I'd have to express myself well and I'd have to make sure I'm heard. So I became very prominent in making sure I'm heard. And, um, and, and that seems to, to work to some extent. But it's still, um, it, it's still prevalent today. But one of the other things, in software, we work across industry sectors. So in my job, I've worked in every industry, from agriculture, veterinary, medical, fire service. You know, you work in everything, so you get snippets of this. And what I would say was, rather than being in the IT industry when that grew, I sort of went off into the electronics industry. And I think probably I do not suffer really any sexism or anything in the electronics industry. So the electronics industry, I think, is brilliant at that. And the, there are very, very few women who work in it. I was trying to look it up today. It's one of the fewest that have women working in it. But I, I just don't think it... it happens in, in actually in electronics, which is very different from what I see in general tech. So I think when we're thinking about women working in computing and in technology, it's important to think about those industries. And there's some great examples. I was um, talking to people from Raytheon, and, and they really actively promote women a lot in, in bringing them in. So it's, um, I'm not saying that all, you know, all organisations are going to suffer, but that's been my observation. Um, the last point is about the number of women in it. When I first started, proportionately, there were few, but proportionately more than there are now. So there were definitely more. And I've thought a lot about why that is. Um, because when we started, there weren't the barriers that there are now. And that's general across the board. So you could go into computing, into coding, um, really without any qualifications mm. whatsoever. And a lot of women did because of the peop of the organisations that were offering training. A lot of women worked in those organisations and they gave everybody the opportunity to do that. So um, it was cross-sector and, and they just went and did it and they became coders and programmers. Now we don't have that opportunity. So if I think we really, you know, where did all the women go? Well... You know, they're not going to be inspired at 16, necessarily. I mean, lots of people aren't inspired at 16 to study STEM subjects. We might want everybody to, but, you know, people aren't. And people don't necessarily know what they want to do at 16. So, therefore, it's really important as we go through our careers that you have the opportunity to switch careers. And people change their jobs. I looked this up today as well an average of 12 times in their life. So why is it that we have to decide at 16 that we are not going to be an engineer? You know, if you turn it on its head, why are we saying people have got to decide then that they're not going to be an engineer? Why is it that we don't have many different ways to get into our industry and to reskill and to retrain? And I think that the reason why there were women originally was because they had the opportunity to do that. And the reason why there's less now is because the women who are older cannot do that. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, gosh, that is a lot to um, take in and think about, actually. There's a lot of really good points. I'm going to just stay, though, on the, um, the issue of, of where the women, the past, and that there were more women in the past, and now mm. there, there are fewer now. Um, there was a really great piece on NPR um, earlier this year, and I think it was a repeat of an older one, about looking at um, the number of women going into computer science um, at an undergraduate level in the United States. And the graph drops precipitously in the mid-80s. And the question was, why? What happened in the mid-80s? Um, and one of the theories was that this was when um, computers started to be something that were marketed to small businesses, and they kind of became... Uh, for men and their businesses, and women in the adverts were being used as decorative props next to the, the computer, which is a relatively compelling theory, I think. You know, there's also the issue of what happens to women's um, interests and, and women's careers when they become professionalised. So in the early days, a lot of women were 
involved in computer programming because it was seen as a menial task. And with the advent of the personal computer, suddenly it stopped being menial and it started being professional. And you see this in other areas as well. So um, the professionalization of craft brings you art. The professionalization of nursing brings you uh, doctors and surgeons. And so you see women's work becoming professionalized and being coded as men's work. So I would like to um, ask the panel, we've got a couple of theories for what happened in the mid 80s. Do you have other competing theories as to what might have gone on? And do we think that what happened in America also happened here? Or do we think that the UK might have something else driving that drop off of women? I think there may be a flip. It may be about a broadening of opportunity for women as well. So women having a choice to, to enter more professions and maybe not choosing that route which was available to them. So once you became, you know, once you're at this point that you now have to take a degree in order to get into this profession, you have the, if you're 18 and bright, you've got, suddenly you've got this huge spectrum of things that you can choose. So has it been a compelling enough argument to bring women in? So I think it, it could be the other way around, that it's not just that, um, you know, it's that women are actually actively choosing not to go into the industry. And I know when I, whenever I've done any STEM talks, whenever I've done recruitment days and stood, it's, it's almost impossible to get girls to stop to have a conversation mm. because they're set on doing other things. It's not, it's not that they're not ambitious and they haven't got ideas about what they want to do. They just want to do something else, something that they see to be more exciting, more glamorous, more whatever. Mm. I think... Um, uh, when uh, in, in our business, one of the ways that I've tried to raise awareness and to tackle what I had experienced um, was to begin interviewing lots of different women who were working very loosely in tech. And, uh, and I remember one young woman we spoke to, uh, an apprentice actually, who'd got an apprenticeship at Cisco, so she'd done, she'd done very well. Um, and at Cisco, when you're an apprentice, you move um, from department to department. And she said, look, you just need to stop talking about it as being tech. Now, that's what puts women off. Mm. Talk, say it's digital or say it's something else. Give it another name. Because, at this, it's, you know, when young, bright women have many choices and maybe they just don't want to do this. I think that could be um, very much the case because we know that um, as girls develop their self-identity, which they, they do quite young, um, they start to self-identify specifically as not being interested in STEM because they don't see it as... Um, as having social worth, they don't see it as being important. Um, and we see this as well with um, women wanting to work for companies that have social value, that are ethical. So is there something as an industry we can do to actually um, make clear the social worth of, of what we do and make clear that you know, ethically this is a valuable sector to be in? It depends on which bit of the technology you're thinking of. For example, I don't think it's ethical to work in a social media company, say, um, because it's based on a fraudulent business model, which involves um, essentially um, monetizing user data in all kinds of um, ways, some of which we now know to be antisocial. So um, I'm, I'm not sure I'd recommend any, anybody, male or female, to work in a social media company, for example. Um, <coughs> that would not apply to other parts of the computing industry for me, but, um, but certainly there's, um, at, as the industry has changed, I mean, it has gone from, from it has gone through several um, uh, really huge transformations. I mean, when you mentioned that there was this, this dip in the mid-80s, well, the mid-80s are a significant moment in the history of the industry because they, uh, that's, that's the part of the, that, that's when the the kind of the big iron type of uh, computing, including many computers, um, suddenly suddenly began to falter. You had the, the arrival of the Macintosh in, in 84, you had the arrival of the IBM PC, um, and the industry then really began to change very quickly. Um, and one of the, so one, one of the factors in that was, was the rise of, of a different kind of approach to programming, to the rise of the hacker ethic, all that kind of stuff. And it would be a very interesting project, and I guess some sociologists have done it, to know what actually lay behind this, this, this drop that you've mentioned. 
it's an interesting question. I have no idea why, what the answers would be, but it is, if it did happen, then it's interesting. Yeah. And I, I think it would be, uh, I think it's important to understand where the women went, because um, I yes. think that gives us an insight into what went wrong. Um, any questions from the audience? Anyone have got any burning questions to ask yet? Hi, my name's Lucy. Um, I work for ARM in Cambridge. Um, I'd understood that in Russia they didn't have this problem, that there, it was not uncommon for girls and women to go into technology. There was a BBC news article about that not very long ago. So it may be that we're wrong to say, oh, it's about women's behaviour, or it's about this that's gone wrong in Britain, but there's something bigger going on about the social structure. Has anybody else got any experience of the, the Russian situation? Thank you. It's my name is Irina and I'm a volunteer here and I have almost 30 years of hands-on software development experience and I'm, I was born in Ukraine. So in Ukraine in the 80s it was a group of 10 women I worked for and we did, as I can understand now, a really good job. Then I moved to, dif I moved to different countries and after working in approximately 10 companies and four countries, I met only two women software developers. And when I read about this uh, Demala case, and he mentioned that probably he compared industries, and he said that in mining, you would not find women. And in some stage, I started to think, is this industry really for women? So my question is, is this industry really for women? Or oh, we do have some biological and psychological differences which keep us away from this. Thank you. So, well, I would think that it's quite the opposite. I mean, my experience is this industry is most definitely for women. Yeah. It is so suited for women. Everything about the female traits match software development. It's logical, it's organised, it's you know, it, it's just so, that, which is why I clearly cannot understand it, really, why you would not want to come and work. I mean, I know I, I enjoy it, but, but it is so suited to the thing that women tend to want in their lives. And, you know, like ethically speaking, the ethics of software engineering are huge and doesn't get spoken about a lot, but the, the issues that you're faced with as a software engineer, the decisions that you're making, and the, you know, making sure that your software is right and is not going to kill someone, which I do on a daily basis, is, you know, immense. And I think none of that is spoken about in our industry. And I think one of the problems that we have when we talk about uh, the industry, and I talk sort of about software and electronics and computing, there isn't any one voice for it. And sort of what happened, I think, in the mid-80s is IT. And I said I went through the IT revolution. And that is when, really, we went away from having one voice as the computing industry to having many voices, even to the point that the British Computer Society is no longer the British Computer Society. It changed many years ago to be called BCS, the, the voice of the IT industry or something. So we do not actually have any one body that's looked after the software industry or the computing industry. Yeah. Uh, you've got the IEE, on the other hand, who look after some parts, parts of it, but again, they only can pay lip service to it because they have everything else and it's a very small part of it. So one of the things that I think happened in the mid-80s was that the advent of the IT meant of IT and the need for many, many more programmers overnight, you know, with the advent of the PC, you just needed loads more and it needed loads more investment. So it comes back to your point about corporate investment because I went out in the mid 80s looking for corporate investment and people, you know, yeah. the, 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 I was sort of dismissed. I was this sort of little woman and, you know, so I didn't go down that route. I went down another route where I didn't need the investment. Uh, but then that's when the money comes in, that's when the big boys come in, that's when the corporations come in and, 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 then it, it grew from there. So I think that that's really where 
the difference in the type of organisation and the ethics and the reasons why those organisations were there was different. And that's why I, you know, the IT and then the tech industry maybe is different from where I am. So, I mean, to go back to the, the culture question, if the, so in India, I believe as well, it, there's the culture is, um, is different and the you know, women are um, more able to, to get engaged in IT and, and computing. And actually what you're saying is really about culture and, and yeah. sort of identity yeah. and voice. Is, is culture a big thing? Amanda, what do you think? Uh, culture within, within culture the actual broadly, domain. And, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. culture, Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, we certainly have a cultural issue very broadly about the way that women are treated and the way that mm -hmm. um, we deal with in, things like implicit bias. Mm -hmm. But specifically within the industry is, do we have a toxic computing mm -hmm. culture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so actually I've worked in many different countries and it's always been... It's actually an extremely difficult question to answer because it's always been based, or my experience of culture has been based on, it can be the 10 people that you're working with. And I think that dominates much more than, like, say, the culture of the country or the religion or whatever it may be. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I, it's, a good, it's a good point, and culture definitely will, at the end of the day, define how you're how you feel at work, if you feel comfortable, and if you can actually uh, strive in that environment. But it will be up to the group leader at the end of the day to, he's he or she is responsible. There you go, another bias. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so no, uh, yeah. And um, yeah, I just actually wanted to add something to, to what you said before about, um, you know, how about women and, and IT and, um, I think it's it's not much it's not so much about is IT an area where women um, should be. It's more about um, it should be an area that anybody um, can join. It being such a powerful area, it would be very very dangerous if it would be um, reduced to only one type of person because it affects everybody. It affects the whole globe, uh, and and it's our responsibility to make sure that everybody can enter and can contribute and is heard. Uh, because otherwise we, we take it down uh, only one route and that's not going to serve the whole population. So yeah, And I think that's been made very clear with things like uh, Apple's health app, which launched without any form of yeah. period tracking. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and you can see uh, that it would have taken one woman in yeah. that room to go, uh, excuse me, and they would not have had that problem. It's like Dave Barry's wife saying, why would anybody want to do it? That's the point that, 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 mm -hmm. that, that, that's missing all the time in this industry, is, is a perspective which is not male. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, it impoverishes the products, among other things, as you've just said. I mean, the period thing, missing the period thing, was weird. You could, I, I was astonished when I, when I learned that. Um, how could a group of intelligent, high IQ people... I mean, the other thing we have learned from the industry, though, is that it's full of high IQ people who have no common sense, um, and actually know nothing about the world if you just want to watch what's happening to Mark Zuckerberg. Mm. Like, this poor lad has no knowledge at all of the world. He may be a very high IQ, but he's completely, he's, he's so naive in relation to how the world actually works. And the industry is full of people like that, full of males like that. And, and, um, and, but more than that, they're also um, valorized in it. So they're the heroes. So here's, here's a, a, a kid who starts, who starts a, a, a company um, after having a, a, a particularly sexist sort of uh, experiment first in Harvard. Um, so he, he starts a company, and, and when, they, when they launch on the stock market, his mantra for his developers is, move fast and break things. Mm. Now, that appeals to a certain kind of warped male personal, uh, <laughs> personality, but it's nuts. Yeah. It's absolutely nuts. And yet he's, a, he's, he's viewed as a kind of hero. There's mm. a... You know, there's a big film about him and all that. This is, that's what's wrong with the industry. Why would, why would you want to work in an industry like that if you're a woman? I think it, this, again, comes down to culture and the homogenized <coughs> culture of particularly uh, Silicon Valley. Um, and it is very male. Uh, in this case, young rather than middle-aged. Male and yeah. very white. Um, and, and what... I wonder what role the uh, cultural fit has in, in creating that because um, I went through sort of a few uh, uh, tech industry interviews in the sort of late 90s 
and, and fails cultural fit every time, um, which I now feel quite proud of. Um, but that idea of cultural fit to me, I find that quite disturbing, because that's a bit like saying if, you, if you're different to us, you don't belong. We only want people who think the way that we do. And we know that groupthink is a major problem, particularly in, in terms of um, coming up with good products and, and uh, having good solutions. Claire, what do you think about cultural fit? Yeah, I was just thinking uh, as you were talking, because I, if I think back to what Val said about the greatest challenge that most people in the industry have, it's the shortage of talent. So if the cultural fit is so prescribed that you exclude people on that basis, then you are literally um, removing half of the population from your mm. potential pool of candidates. And I think... You know, I, I think in any industry, some of the issues and challenges that women face are faced in many other industries mm. and particularly at senior levels. But I think the reason it's so pertinent for tech is because we have this, it's probably the fastest growing sector mm. with the, the shortest, the, the greatest talent shortage. So the industry has to confront it and work out how mm. to change it because otherwise we will have women choosing other career paths. Mm. And, uh, you know, when you when you think about how it's interesting thinking about whether in in other countries is it the same issue, and then we think about our country, how much noise there has been, how much press there has been about trying to support the industry to transform itself, and um, you know, lots of press about it. And then we have the Science and Technology Select Committee, and of those eight nominees, none of them are women. <laughs> so how how. Uh, Culture at a, 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 a micro level within your organisation, I think, is determined by your leader. But when we're thinking mm -hmm. about how we can deal with this very real problem about where, it's not where, where did the women go, but where are we going to get our people from, mm. then we need our, our, yep. our, our global leaders at the macro level to be really demonstrating how you can lead and succeed here. So I might have a small, just a small anecdote. So, well, you know, when I was at the point of my life when I was just trying to decide where I was going to apply, what I was going to do with myself, some of the biggest companies in the world, they advertise and try to attack, attract talent by saying, hey, we have foosball tables and our colors are <laughs> yeah, 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 red yeah, and yeah. green and yellow yeah, yeah. and we go to drink beers together yeah, after work. And yeah, I'm like, yeah. great, yeah, really <laughs> perfect today. fit. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think these are all very positive yeah. things, but people might not notice... Um, this is maybe not the kind of work environment that I would relax no. into. No. And, and that's true of anyone who, say, for example, doesn't drink, you know, yeah. yes. whether they're male yes. or female. If your entire company culture is based on, well, let's all go and get hammered, then that is actively putting off a particular personality type of someone who doesn't like to do that. Someone who is an introvert who doesn't drink is, you know, not going to fit in. That's even yeah. on that basis. I mean, it's not just about ethnicity and, yeah. and class and, and gender. It's even on sort of like introvert versus extrovert. Mm. Mm. So have we got any more questions from the floor? Uh, I'm Martha and I'm 18, so I've just finished school. And so I've experienced kind of, I feel like, STEM and computing at school and people's attitudes to it. And I was just wondering, because obviously we do focus on women where we're talking about, oh, you know, women in tech. But to me, it felt like between the ages of, you know, 11 and 18, boys felt, it seemed like boys had a pressure to uh, conform in either two groups of, like, sport, boys who liked football and rugby, and then the ones who didn't, kind of maths and physics and computer games and computers. And so, as a result, it becomes, it seems to become like a safe space for boys who don't fit in with typically kind of masculine ways in the other way. Yeah. And so what that means is it becomes hostile for girls, young girls. Um, and could it be more that it's, girls almost have more options in my maths A-level class, it was like a 50-50 split, girls and boys, whereas in my English Lit class there was two boys out of 30 girls. So could it be more that boys are being pushed away from, you know, nursing, English literature, things like that, and push towards these things that are becoming the new masculine for boys who don't fit in in the other way? That is an excellent point. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic point, aren't they? What do we think about this? Can, can I just comment? That's a, that's a really sharp comment, um, uh, observation. Um, but what, what it shows, and it goes back to your experience as well, it, it shows that um, what, 
what we're dealing with, we have a symptom, as it were, in the IT industry of a much deeper problem. And it starts in schools. It starts, uh, it starts in, in the cradle, almost. And we're, we're simply commenting on one of its logical outcomes way down the line. But it's, it goes way, way. It really does go, it goes back to very early childhood. It actually, uh, interestingly, goes back to before early childhood yeah. and pregnancy, that um, people who know the uh, gender of the child in the bump talk to the bump differently, depending on whether they think wow. it's a boy or a girl. So, I mean, <laughs> the, these, these <laughs> attitudes are so ingrained. Yeah. Um, and this, this is something that I think about a lot is, you know, we are talking about massive cultural change. We are talking about um, a long-term project because we have major issues around uh, shortage of carers, shortage of nurses, um, and areas where women dominate, where there are not enough men. And some interesting uh, information I, I found out recently is that there's a, a, a huge um, emphasis on things like uh, uh, medical undergrads are like 70, 75% women. Mm, yeah. uh, veterinary studies, uh, veterinary science is, um, somewhere between 70 and 80, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. And this actually is bringing some problems. So with the vets, um, women more, are more likely to want to do small animal practice, which means they're not doing the procedural stuff like research, and they're not doing large animal yeah. work on, on farms. So with, in areas that people are going, well, look, you know, women have cracked it because there's all these women doing um, uh, medicine and, and veterinary science. Actually, it's not, it's not actually healthy to have that kind of, of bias, because again, I think it's the, it's, it's the nurturing stereotype that girls are being pushed into. Um, and, and that to me kind of comes back to, you know, it starts at the cradle, these stereotypes that we're pounding into <laughs> boys and girls. How do we combat stereotypes like that? I think it's difficult to combat them and, and to solve our problem, because it's such a big problem. But what I think you can start out is thinking about this whole the, the whole differences and whether or not that's nature nurture I mean there's a big debate about that about the way people talk to, to the bumps etc but what you need is a, a more of a balance throughout the culture of the company so if you take it that there is a, a culture in the team or the company as we were saying then having a better balance and knowing that there needs to be a bit more nurture and a bit more I suppose, art or a bit more of a making, a bit less hard, softer in the culture to make it more uh, flexible and to make it more conducive to, to women working in there. And then if that happens, then maybe biases shift a bit more. And this, I've, I've noticed that more in relation to what you had been talking about, about product, because mm. I sit in many product development meetings mm. Um, not always with men, actually, because, again, in the electronics industry, in some electronics companies, they're very good at getting women in in order to make sure they have a female input into that. But some of the discussions are hilarious, you yeah, know, yeah. And, uh, and I love it. And I will sit there listening and they will be debating this and you will say, no, but I had a famous one they, when, when well, there was these men trying to decide, you know, on an automatic bath, take take the plug out of a bath automatically, and they decided that you know ten minutes was the longest you'd ever want to stay in a bath, you know, <laughs> and they were adamant about this, and I just collapsed laughing and said, well, of course you don't. And they couldn't really, they didn't actually get the concept of a bath at all anyway. <laughs> so why would you? So it's that sort of thing, and and. So many white boxes on the wall. That's another thing that, you know, when you do get women involved, you get mm. the white box on the wall. Everything's in a white box. Why on earth do you want lots of white boxes on the wall, for heaven's sake? <laughs> you, know, you want things that are different. And, and I think if you start thinking about those issues and you start thinking about the cross-disciplinary nature mm. and, the, and the lots of different skills that different people bring rather than it being very siloed. So I think the point that... There is this push for boys feel comfortable in tech and they will then learn from each other and they will talk to each other. And that girls tend to be, yeah, more focused across the board when they're at school, which goes back to my point. 
that you shouldn't expect a girl at 16 to decide that she doesn't want yeah. to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the crux of the matter. We can't really change everything, but we can change that. I think we can, as an industry, open it up to girls that, and women of all ages. And to be honest, going back to the point where we now know that we need even more coders, developers than ever, this is just growing and exploding, then that needs to happen across, across the board. So we need to take down the barriers of thinking that whatever you're going to do in school is what's going to define you. Yeah. And although we need to start a school and, I'm, you know, you need your education, but you need to stop it being a barrier later on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It also goes back, sorry, it also goes back to, <coughs> to um, a, more, a more realistic appraisal of what women are... I mean, there are, there are differences between men and mm. women, but women are especially good at some things. Mm. And what was ironic about the Google case, about James Dunmore, was that um, he, he made this, you know, he, he, he did the classic stuff, which is that I'm all in favour of women and diversity and the rest of it, but there's always mm. a but. Okay, and then he goes into this rant. Um, well, what Google ought to have done in that case is they ought to have pointed out to him that the days when software development was a kind of a gizmo, uh, macho lone hero business are over broadly speaking this is about teams mm. and guess what even by his logic women are much better at exactly. teamwork than men yeah. and it, you know but but instead of arguing that which is which is the case the the, the company just dodged it mm. and didn't take him didn't take it on and sacked him on the basis of, of something else um, and that's the real irony about it, because not only do we need more people to work in this, in, this, in, in this industry, but we also need people who have the special kinds of um, um, talents that, that women have more than men. Mm, exactly. I mean, some men are yeah. good at teamwork too. Yeah. But, and that's what's maddening about this, because we're kind of <laughs> you know, yeah. ignoring the fact that half of the population has skills that we need. Yeah, and I think it focuses on the skills that are the technical skills and not the other skills. Yeah. But actually, the technical skills, are, you know, when you need to have somebody researching and designing, you know, a new chip, a new silicon, etc., then obviously you need to be educated at a high level and there will always be that need and they'll be there. But for the majority of the work that we do, if someone knows Ohm's Law, and if happily they can do a differentiation, you know, just a simple, I can teach them the rest. You know, seriously, they just need to know that, and then I can teach them how to code. I can, t but so long as they want to and they have some aptitude and they're willing and keen. The things that I can't teach them is how easily is how to interact well in a team, how to speak and be polite, and how to have the good ethics and values. And they are more difficult to teach. And that's when sometimes, yeah, I, I don't know about the cultural fit. I was asked that question the other day, is that difficult? And I say, no, it's never a difficulty because the people who come in, you're in I'm interviewing them as a person. I also I look at their skills, but so long as I think I can teach them the skills from the education level that they're at, that's not so important to me as that they have all these other features. So in, in women, I've recruited more recently women who don't have technology degrees because that's the only way. Well and also a technology degree of 10 or 15 years ago may not be relevant and certainly won't exactly. be in the next 10 years and I think that there is an opportunity for the industry, it comes back to the point that you made in your opening um, five points about opportunity, variety and flexibility mm. because there is, the, the, there is a difference between men and women and the largest difference is that women tend to still generally take a period of time off in order to look yeah. after mm. their children and I've got four children myself and, and that's been something that I've made a positive choice to do. There is a time after that where women are actively looking for new careers where they're feeling extremely low in confidence, where they mm. feel de-skilled, where what they did is no longer relevant to what they, they want to do. And this is a, 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 an industry where you can work flexibly and you can have opportunity and variety. And I do think there's a, a we've seen some signs of it with some of the big corporations launching returners programmes I think there is a real opportunity for the industry to really lead across different sectors and say, actually, this group of women in their 50s and 60s, it doesn't matter what they did 20 years ago, nobody cares. It's about whether or not you've got the attitude yeah. now to take on this mm. new skill. What, we don't care what you learned 20 years ago because it exactly. wouldn't have been relevant now anyway. Mm. But that has to be a very flexible, it has to be a very pragmatic 
approach to what it means to be employed. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think there is an opportunity for the industry to do that. But it comes back to that, the, the kind of the macro culture really driving that. Mm-hmm. I think that's what's so disappointing about the select committee because it's not showing that, that women, older women, really can be influencers. Mm-hmm. I think this actually comes back to uh, uh, another um, NPR um, uh, random factoid that I heard on the radio was that um, 10, 15 years ago, 75% of companies offered staff training and now it's down to like 20, 25%. Um, And and also another related issue around recruitment Mm. is algorithmic sorting of CVs, that if you don't get the right Mm. keywords Mm. in your CV, it just gets tossed out before a human Mm. even sees it. So I feel like there are these like really fundamental issues here that that are quite tractable you know the big culture change stuff is you know big and and a bit scary and we have to nibble away at it around the edges but recruitment and training surely those are easy to fix yeah i mean i mean they should be shouldn't they i think when you when you talk about stem in schools they always talk to the kids about you know don't bother them thinking about what it is you're going to do now because the jobs you're going to be doing we don't even know what they are so it's there's got it's about flexibility i think just being really really pragmatic about Mm -hmm what it is you're asking people to do and you're right you can teach you can teach people anything you can you tell as long as they want to learn that's that's the most important thing and you know a, a nice stand you know basics of some things in stem but most people learn that through their early years and then people then carry on and learn and study and if they're really interested then they study more and then if they're really interested then they will can go and do a master's i mean i've just had someone going to do a master's and you know, there's lots of opportunities for people to then get in and do masters or you know the the cross masters. And I think one of the other things, like in the 80s, was the advent of a lot of legal stuff coming that was very attractive to women. There are lots of people do, lots of women I know do law conversion courses. Well, I yeah. don't know why do you all go and do law conversion courses? Why don't you come and do a nice software conversion course? <laughs> Except for that there isn't one. <laughs> but, yeah, just going back to the cultural thing as well, there, there, there are, as far as I can tell, there are no compelling sort of cultural icons who are women in, in this whole industry. I mean, Steve Shirley was, is a very yeah. dramatic example, yeah. but she's very rare. Um, at, but most of the, the, the cultural heroes who were associated with this industry are dysfunctional males. Mm-hmm. Yes, and it's and a good point ma- because Steve Shirley is elderly and it, uh, all of the evidence shows that a, a 16-year-old simply won't see somebody who is that old yeah. as somebody iconic mm-hmm. yeah. to follow. They yeah. simply won't connect yeah, no, to them. Yeah. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Sorry. We have a question. This is sort of point or... My name's Anne Clark. Um, I work for Cambridge Assessment, um, but I'm also on the steering group for Cambridge Aidways, which is Women's Science and Engineering. And it was Claire's conversation about returning. Um, I find it very hard having had a career break to return. And about three years ago, um, with Cambridge Aidways, we did actually return this day in Cambridge. And we're about to run another one on the 4th of November. So if people are interested, come and ask me about it afterwards. But I thought it was an absolute moment <laughs> just to say yeah. that. So, Excellent. We need more return ships and uh, more returners to actually return. One of the factoids I learned when I saw it, just uh, when I looked up today about the returning and the number of jobs that people had, it sort of said in this study that the number of jobs that men and women had was actually quite similar, even though most of the women had actually also taken breaks in that, and that, that what they then achieved could be the same because quite a lot of the time the men just sort of did a job for a longer period of time, weren't really progressing their careers. Yep. And so therefore this break wasn't necessarily to be seen as detrimental because people got to a particular point and they were sort of on this same treadmill, not wishing to, yep. to sort of advance their career or take any risks or anything, probably because their yep. wives or partners of that were at home <laughs> with the baby. So I thought that was sort of quite interesting really that it shouldn't really make a difference and this whole thing about the career break I think is just is just nonsense because people either yeah just paddle or lots of people just take different things and take different routes. I just wanted to say something um, that fits perfectly into this topic of recruiting uh, and also combines my point of attitude that I mentioned before um, so there are statistics, apparently, um, that say that men apply to positions when they feel that they hit about 50% of the required skills, whereas women oh, yeah. would only apply when they hit, like, 95 or something around there. Um, 
I find, I mean, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what yeah. I would uh, yeah. do. Um, but, but there again, I think that, uh, you know, coming back to my point of attitude, maybe we should just be a little bit more out there and a little bit more aggressive about what we think we can do or what we can learn within the first three weeks on the job. Or we can get companies to rethink how they do job ads. Mm. Yeah. Um, and actually use more of a narrative form instead of a bullet point form. Um, I mean, there's uh, some really interesting data out of a company in America called Textio, and they have a, a database which is uh, millions of job ads and the in information of the resultant hire. And male language, so stuff like uh, Ninja Coder, Rockstar Developer, you know, Genius, Fantastic, all these kind of like very sort of male uh, language. The language of the ad predicts the language of the hire. So if you flip that on the other side and have very much a kind of team leader, nurturing, caring kind of language, you'll be more likely to get um, a woman uh, being hired for the job. So there is, again, I think this is a tractable problem. This is something we can actually have policies for and, and address within companies. It's like, how are you writing your job ads? Are you doing male coded bullet points in which case you won't get very many women, or are you doing more of a narrative job ad that has a more neutral language so that you get the widest possible pool of candidates? Or do both. Mm. Or do both. I think, you know, if you want... You don't, we're not saying that we want women without men in the industry. I think, you know, to, to turn it on its head and find ourselves in an industry that was dominated by a majority of women wouldn't be any more healthy than the place that we're at I now. can't see that ever happening. I mean, <laughs> honestly, is that a real risk? I don't think so. Uh, yes. You think it's yeah. a real risk? Well, in my domain, so I work in robotics and a bit of computer science, um, the areas that are dominated by women completely in my area are human robot interaction and human computer interaction mm. and if you're a man in that area you're a minority and i think that hci and hri will become very important areas yeah. um, in the next coming years seeing that you know more robots and human environments etc um, are we getting back into the whole women and nurturing thing and human well and it actually plays into mm, it plays into a little bit um, also one of the previous comments like what are women good at and, and, and because psychology plays such a strong role in HCI and HRI mm -hmm. that is probably one of the reasons why there are so many women in there. So again, it's cleaning um, to stereotype rather than yeah, busting yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> John, did you want to make a point? Um, I just think it's very, it is very hard to break stereotypes. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that from long history, but, um, but part of it is to do with, um, part of it is to do with, with the mass media. I mean, it goes back to the point that there, there are, as far as I, I know, there are no women heroes, female heroes, mm -hmm. in anything connected with this industry. Um, and and the, the male heroes, so to speak, are in general pretty dysfunctional human beings, broadly speaking. Um, so th that's not a promising, you know, we live in a culture where people are, where young people in particular, are shaped to some extent by the media environment. Mm -hmm. And if the media environment says basically this is all about dysfunctional males, um, then if you're an intelligent woman, you'd say to hell with that, I'm not having this with it. You know, and it's, it's really, it's really, well, it could be, sometimes, if, 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 you, if there turns out to be a compelling story about somebody who has achieved something great and who is not a man in this field, that would be something else. Maybe this is our opportunity here with the um, what Amanda's saying, the, um, where the opportunity is in the future of the relationship between AI and humans. That, mm -hmm. um, if there are women who are pioneering in that field, maybe that's our, our, our opportunity to make them icons which can inspire, if they're young women who can inspire other young women. So th this is obviously something I'm, I'm uh, very much my purview, because that's what Ada Lovelace Day is all about, is yeah. trying to create new role models and, and, and tell people what women have done uh, across STEM. And, um, and if you haven't already picked up the little booklet, um, you should, because it's full of uh, really amazing women who've done fantastic work. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, there isn't a female Bill, Bill Gates, there isn't a female Mark Zuckerberg. Yep. I mean, there's Grace Hopper and, and Hedy Lamarr and, and Ada Lovelace and that, but um, 
they aren't lionized in the same way. And this is the ninth Ada Lovelace day. And I'm still having the argument on Twitter about was Ada Lovelace really the first computer yeah. programmer? Oh. Uh, did she really, is it, was it really a computer? Did she really write a program? <laughs> did she really write it? I mean, you can emphasize whichever word you like in that <laughs> sentence and someone will have asked me that question. So we have a, a, an issue and it becomes, I think, self-reinforcing because when the media focus on the stars, they're looking for the people they think are the compelling stories and because a lot of the tech media is, uh, you know, these articles are written by men, the editors are men, they connect with other men and they dismiss women because they suffer from the same inherent biases that we all do. So again, it, there's a bit of a, a, a challenge there about how do we start to create new female role models and how do we um, elevate the women who are doing groundbreaking? They exist. It's just that we don't hear about them. <clears throat> Can I just say, I find, I don't hold, I mean, I, I admire Bill Gates. I don't necessarily say I admire Mark Zuckerberg, but I do admire Bill Gates, but I don't admire him as a programmer, right? He's not a programmer. He bought an operating system off of people who wrote that program, and he marketed it really well. All right, he, he could write some things in basic. He wrote the basic interpreter for the Tandy machine. Yeah. And he, but, knew, he knew every but bit he of it didn't, by heart. Yeah, but that's not a I great know, yeah, program. No, you're right. I agree yeah? with you. No, really, agree. really. Because, yeah. no, I, right. you know, I mean, I wrote a basic interpreter. Anybody could write a basic interpreter, yeah. seriously. But you, yeah. but to to grow what he did wasn't on his programming skills. He wrote that, yep. and then he, then he realised actually the power of it. And what he did was he went and bought something off of somebody else because he knew that that was going to be actually quite difficult to write. So he bought it. He didn't write it, yep. and then he took that on further <coughs> forward. And then he is a very very good businessman, very focused, and he had a real vision. His vision was, I want a computer in everyone's home, and IBM laughed at him. And, you know, who's laughing now? So that is why I, I admire him, because he had that vision. Mark Zuckerberg is similar, because he had a vision. So these people had a vision that was a sort of societal changing vision, but they're not really the same icons that we're comparing, say, Ada Lovelace or the scientist, or, or particularly Grace Hopper, who's particularly one of my heroes yeah. technically, because I was in compilers. That's what I studied and did and I wanted to go on and do. I didn't actually do it, but, but in technically. So I think we're not comparing like with yeah. like when we're looking at that, and I think that's one of the issues that we've got. So if you want a model to compare with them, it, they will be business leaders, and there's many of those who will be running maybe fashion tech companies. I mean, there's the lady who did the bras. Now, she's a very good user of technology, you know. So she, to me, is a great, you know, she's transforming things. I think it's, it's a bit um, foxes and badgers, isn't it? You know, the, yeah. the kind of, the foxes are all sleek and charming and, and everyone impresses them and the badgers are really just getting on with the work and quietly ignored. There was, um, I was just going to add, it's a, it's a very a personal comment, but um, the uh, Sunday Times run this tech track league table. And the first time my company was on that, um, we were, I think, number 50 in the league. So there were many people who were high up in the league. And I think I was one of three women that were there. And I started my business with my husband. There was two of us. And the Times asked if they, on the photograph they could chop him off and just have me because they wanted to run a piece on women in tech. And I, he was happy to do that. It seemed more beneficial for the business to have uh, our, the picture, the big picture in the paper rather than the small one. But it was uh, the, the reason I mentioned it was because I had a very strange personal reaction to it because I discovered on the Monday morning after the newspaper had come out that the Times were using my picture as the header for the, um, the league table. Now, the person who was number one on the league table, wasn't me. And for weeks, up until they had the award ceremony, there was my picture online. <laughs> and I, I, had a, I, I really struggled with working out whether that, obviously, that seemed to be a good thing, but it didn't have my brand. I wasn't wearing a T-shirt. And I thought, well, why are they using my face to advertise their league table? Traditionally, women have been used to advertise things not because of their brilliant business sense or their groundbreaking technology. They've just reused it because it makes people look at the newspapers. And uh, so I think that there's a, there's a more complex um, 
uh, there's something else going on when we mm. think about what it is and why it is that we want to look but, at people. So it's a very personal anecdote, but... But there's an interesting history to that. Because, as, you, as you, most of you know, um, the most successful newspaper in this country is the Daily Mail. Mm. Why is the Daily Mail... Well, the Daily Mail was a moribund um, kind of pedestrian newspaper many, many years ago. And then it got a new editor called David English. And David English had one big inspiration, which was that 50% of the population are women. And every newspaper in Britain was written by men for men. And David English had the idea that there might be a big market here. And one of the first things he did was he instituted a rule which was that on every page of the, of the Daily Mail under his editorship, if there was a story that could conceivably be illustrated with a photograph of a woman, put it on. And from that basis, the Daily Mail grew to be the most, pro most profitable and most powerful newspaper in this country. And it was based on an editor, a man, noticing that 50% of the population were women and they might read newspapers too. <laughs> and sadly, look what they did with it. Um, yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> That's not a great story. Okay, any more questions? Um, let's come back 10 to 8, one at the back. Fantastic. That's where the, your picture is on. Yes. I won't go on because I know we're, we're all, all to finish. But my name's Chris. I uh, work in the arts. I'm a composer. I work in the theatre and, and media generally. Fascinated by, I do a lot of work in where technology and the arts intersect. And just following on from the point about education in schools, and uh, I'm quite a passionate advocate of something called STEAM, which is introducing an A into STEM, which gets the arts sort of into yeah. it as well. And, and the thing that alarms me is maybe we've just taken another wrong turn with pushing stem so much. I know when I was at school, if I would have been pushed down the stem route as an artist, I would have won, won, won a million miles away. But yeah. as, a, as a writer of music, and I dabble with code quite a bit, the thing that I find makes my uh, sort of brain go, go wild is, is the abstracted thought and the creativity and uh, th that's involved in playing around with code. There's a big drive in um, uh, co live coding uh, now, and there's software like Sonic Pi, Super Collider. There's a collective of women who do live coding um, as, as performance as well. Uh, and it strikes me that this is, um, perhaps I know it's a slow burn kind of cultural change, but I think if we were to try and celebrate the creativity that the arts world can bring to coding, and, and let's call coding developing and something a bit more mm -hmm. uh, encouraging like that, then we might see a gradual um, sort of a, a gradual change in approaches and attitudes as well. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that. Can, can I just comment on that? I mean, I, I think, I think you're, that's very interesting, and, and, um, and I think you're onto something. In fact, one of the big mistakes that was made by well-intentioned people was this obsession with code, the word code, coding. Code. And a, a particular criminal in this respect, I guess, is Michael Gove, um, who was then the, although he has, lot, funnily enough, when he was education secretary, he had some things to be said for it. But, um, but it, he had, he or somebody in his department had this idea that, that if you wanted to encourage children to learn to, to write programs, then uh, at some stage he, they came up with the slogan that code is the new Latin. Okay, and they didn't appear to notice that Latin was effectively a dead language, and that's. That, I think coding was the wrong word for this. Um, uh, it was. It, it was. Um, it was designed somehow to, to uh, get away from the idea of, of the concept of a program or programming, uh, and it may be that program is also the wrong word, but code was the wrong one in my opinion, um, and it's become a kind of a cliche. Um, and where, the really important thing for for kids. It is to is to understand that that computer programs are things that are malleable; they can be changed. And the way to get, of course, to get that message across to them is to allow them to write some programs themselves and then change them. Um, but uh, but I think that the obsession with the word code has been has, has been a mistake. It has echoes of Bletchley Park. It has echoes of of cryptography. And all kinds of other stuff. And my hunch is that that's going to be self-defeating in the long run. I'm sorry to say. I, th I think it's I think it's a good thing. I've been to lots of coding and hackathons and yeah. more recently. And and you're right, it, it's good. And there's lots of good things happening. It is slow burning. It's going on. And I've been asked recently 
to describe the difference between programming, coding and developing. And I think that all three words have a, have a point. They're actually different. And when explained, they can be used well um, to describe the activities, uh, the activities that, you're, that you're doing. And this sort of comes back to my cross-curricular thinking about programming, coding and developing. Because when I describe it to people, I say, you are writing. You are writing code, you are writing an authored work. So I, and, in it, and actually software is, is protected in the same way as books and music is protected. It's a copyrighted piece of art. So I think I try to describe it to people as being an authored work and you're writing, yeah. um, you, you're actually writing this authored work. It happens to get then uh, translated into a set of codes which then gets programmed and you develop it. So they, all those words are important if people really want to understand what they're doing. And that type of language and getting that across is, I think, important. But we have no voice to do that because it gets lost. You know, mm. we don't really have a voice. No one much explains it, although it does happen at, at events, like I'm sure that, you've, that you're referring to. And, and I really encourage this STEAM idea because um, it brings back the idea of when I started encoding, the guy sat, in next, sat next to me, he was a Latin scholar actually, <laughs> and had come into computing and, and he would, you know, he, he couldn't do anything with his Latin, so he became a programmer. Yeah, wow. yeah? Smart. And, and there wasn't really anybody who I'd say had come down a STEM route particularly, I mean there were quite a few mathematicians because it's very logical because you so it lends itself to that, probably more so than actually some of the sciences. So why they put the coding and programming specifically into STEM, I think is probably one of the issues. I think we can't really mention this without mentioning C.P. Snow's Two Cultures, um, which is a, a you know, uh, if you haven't sort of looked it up, um, it's a great essay from about 50 years ago, which is complaining about exactly this problem, this split between kind of uh, humanities and, and sciences. Um, and, and I think, you know, this does start at school. You know, you get split into sciences or, or arts and it doesn't recognise that we can be both artistic and analytical. We can yeah. be capable of both enjoying chemistry and physics and enjoying, uh, you know, art and dance and, and music. And it becomes ossified by the way that we fund uh, organisations, I think. Um, I've, I've had a lot of calls for Ada Lovelace say, to be STEAM rather than STEM, and, and the, the issue then is that you start to, um, for a small organisation with, with um, sort of limited resources, you're diluting the message of what you're doing, which makes it harder to sell to sponsors and funders. So we're kind of stuck mm. in the, I would love to expand it out, but I'm kind of stuck until I kind of reach a, a point where it becomes clearer how we have that conversation with the people that fund us. Because at the moment, it's hard enough being STEM and not just science or just tech or just engineering. And no one really actually seems to bother about the maths. But um, <laughs> this is, uh, I think, you know, we, we're starting this, separation at school and then we're reinforcing it all the way along and and I think it's to everyone's detriment. Um. Well a, a small anecdote right the, the, I went to a talk by the lady who ran part of the Halladron Collider that uh, you know, identified the Higgs boson, an Italian lady and uh, her training was very broad based as it is in Italy and her first job was as a classical pianist and she became a classical pianist because she discovered when she was 18 or something that she couldn't be a ballerina. And then after being a classical pianist for a while, she decided she didn't want to travel anymore and became a physicist and then went to uh, CERN. So I think, and, and when asked, how can you do that? She said, well, you just do it. In Italy, we just do it. <laughs> That's the way the education set up. So why don't we go to Italy yeah. and learn some lessons? <laughs> Fantastic. It's, it's like there was an interview on the radio mm -hmm. with an 80-year-old woman, and unfortunately I don't know her name, and they said, have you got any regrets? And she said, yes, I regret not starting to learn to play the violin when I was 60, because if I had, I'd have been playing for 20 years by now. <laughs> <laughs> so right. any more questions from the floor? Uh, hello. Um, 
Hello, um, my name is Alicia and I'm a user experience designer, which means I <laughs> design software, I don't code, but still I work in IT. And I'm just, I'm just curious how universal this problem is, because I've worked in IT not for that long, for like the last three years, but that's enough to experience something. And I've never experienced any form of bias. Like, I'm really happy working in IT. I feel like, I'm, I'm, like what I do is recognized and appreciated. And I feel like my female colleagues and friends, they are happy too. So I know like numbers um, speak for themselves and there are very few women in IT and that's a problem. But then I'm, I'm curious, the women who are there, I'm curious how many of them experience bias because I've never ever experienced it. And, like, and I don't know if it's because I'm not like, you know, exactly, I'm not an engineer, like I'm, I'm a designer, but I still work with men. I, I work with software. And yeah, so I'm just curious how universal it is. Like, thank you. Uh, something because I've been in uh, computing and computer science all my my life and loads of this you don't even notice. So I have, for example, a psychologist friend, a historian, and when they come to my department, this has been over the time, they notice the stuff that they have never noticed because you grew up with this culture, loads of things that mm -hmm. could be biased, you don't even notice it. Mm -hmm. And only mm -hmm. much later is actually this was bias and this changed me in this way or that way. You kind of just find ways um, subconsciously to change your behavior and you shouldn't be doing that just because of the environment. That's at least, at least my experience. Anyone on the panel want to chip in? It could be, it could be that you work in the, that particular area. Um, that if you worked on an operating system, say, you might have a different experience. I don't, I don't understand. Well, do, you, do you know what the numbers are? Do you know what percentage of your no, ex-designers no, are? There is no bias. I'm sure mm. there is. No, but I, I mean, I wondered whether, uh, because obviously there are uh, different fields, and I wonder in UX design whether or not I know in, um, in Brighton where I live the UX designers that I know are women, and there's a very active group um, to support each other to create a really supportive network. I don't know whether or not the percentage comes back to my first point about it's a yeah, question I of numbers. About, like, because I'm from Poland originally, and I know from Poland about like, half, half of like, UX designers are women, but then it doesn't change the fact that I work mostly with men because mm -hmm. I work with like software engineer and yeah. engineers mm -hmm. and uh, like, and it's like, I don't know, I feel like I'm treated really well. Excellent. And I recognize Good. what I do, so I'm just, and, and I know like a lot of my female friends are really happy too. I know like female developers, mm -hmm. and I, I've never like heard any of them complain. So I'm sure there is a problem and there are numbers that show there is a problem, but then I feel like quite a lot of women are really happy. Like no, I think, I mean, it's a good point. And actually before I came, I went to interview one of the young women that works in the business because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just me going, rah, 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 this is my, <laughs> has been my experience because I, I know that my experience would be different to hers and she's young, it's her first job. And uh, uh, she's uh, learning to code as well. She goes to a, a coding group and uh, she said that she has been... Um, it's very markedly different in the two environments. So in our sector, we sell IT systems, we sell IT solutions, and it is predominantly male. She's learning to code in, a, in an environment where she's being supported by other women, and uh, she felt that it was a completely different ethos and um, how she felt within that environment was different. And I was shocked to hear they were subtle. We're not talking about large... Um, digressions that we've heard about in Silicon Valley, but I was shocked to hear that in my organisation, a handful of things that had been said to her, that, you know, 14% of the people that work for me are, are women, and most of them work in the back office. She's the only person actually in a frontline role, and people had said things to her that really shocked me. Hmm. No, I, I think, you know, we do have to understand that um, the, the sector is not homogenous, so there are good companies with good culture mm. where, you know, the culture is set from the top and, and the mm. people at the top value women and, and they hire other people who value women. And, and there are companies where, where, yeah, maybe it's incredibly rare to, to, to come across sexism. Um, and, and that's fantastic. That's, it's always good to hear someone say, you know, I think the culture where I work is good. What we have to do is make sure that that culture spreads. Um, so we're coming up to, to eight. I think we're kind of, this is about our, um, our do, we, do we have much more time? Yes? Because I was, I was going to do a bit of a, uh, ask the panel to come up with like one thing that you would ask us all to do, to go away and think about or to go away and do. So it's one thing. So my thing 
um, that I think we should all, all go away and do is when we're in meetings and a woman is trying to make a point and trying to speak up and someone interrupts them, we make a point of just going, oh, sorry, can you just finish? And give that woman the support to actually finish her sentences. I cannot count the number of meetings I've been in where I've been cut across and interrupted and just been try trying to make my point. Yeah. Um, and so that would be my one thing that we all go away and do is support women in meetings to have their say. Um, I think mine would be don't assume that people understand the impact that it, the, an environment can have or comments can have on women and, and think, um, think cleverly about what you might be able to do in an organisation, particularly if it is majority male, to educate and to help people to understand actually what it's like to be a woman in, a, in, a, in an environment where they're the minority. I'd write a screenplay for a best-selling movie. In, in which um, an absolutely brilliant um, technical coder who's female uh, saves the world. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, I think that, well, I'm going to take a very positive view. Um, I think there are many people, uh, also men, uh, that are actively supporting women these days in tech, and I think it's our job to... Um, have feelers for those, and when we identify who those are, uh, work with them. Realize what they're doing behind the scenes to make you progress and, and, and believe in yourself and move forwards. I would like to reach out to people in the arts to say, come on in, understand more of what we do so that we could get the message out better. So, for example, I have an idea. I'd love to have one of these deal or no deal games. I'd like to have a a software engineering deal or no deal where you had the box and you had the banker and it come out with all these things in the, in the computing industry about what's good about working in it and then you'd, you'd take it and you wouldn't know what the job is so it might be a particular designer or a developer to get the message across but you, we need to engage with people in the media and the arts positively so I'd like to ask people in the media and the arts to come and engage more positively and not just make the people like Mr. Gates and Mr. Zuckerberg, who are the business end of it, the heroes. Excellent. I think that's a really fantastic slate of things to do. So I'd like you to all uh, join me in thanking the panel for their time this evening. Thank you.